the educational system, uh, namely it's a system of indoctrination of the young. There's got to be some structure that provides you with capacities. Life would be pretty boring if we understood everything. It's better if we don't understand anything. <laughs> I know that we don't. That's the important part. There is no way less likely to get anybody to think about those thoughts than to make that the curriculum. That finishes them. I think that's the purpose. I mean, the purpose is just to impose authority. Here's the great thoughts. All this other stuff is rubbish. Just learn those and you're okay. Passing tests doesn't begin to compare with searching and inquiring and pursuing topics that engage us and uh, excite us. That's uh, far more significant than passing tests. Even the fact that the system has a lot of stupidity in it, I think, has a function. It means that people are filtered out for obedience. They understood that creativity presupposes a set of rules, forms and rules. Students will ask, uh, what are we going to cover this semester? And his standard answer was, it doesn't matter what we cover. It matters what you discover. The public education system was one of real major achievements of this country. It was the first country to have a really broad mass education system. That contributed enormously, not only to the cultural health of the country, but to its economic growth. An individual is stuck. That person is stuck with what exists. But as part of a collective, that person is not stuck. They can be part of an effort to reverse the programs of the past policies of the past 30 years, which have led to the situation in which young people are trapped for life with debt that they cannot get rid of. More funding for the public institutions is coming from tuition than from the state in a rich state. Now, it's not because of the lack of wealth and it's not because of the deficit, it's because of the decision to destroy public education. That top one-tenth of one percent of the population, they don't care. Their kids will be fine. They don't use the public education system. It's privatized, they can pay for it. We can ask ourselves what the purpose of an educational system is, and of course there are sharp differences on, on this matter. My name is Noam Chomsky. I'm a retired professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where I've been for 65 years. I think I can do no better about uh, answering the question of what it means to be truly educated than to go back to some of the classic views on the subject. For example, the views expressed by the founder of uh, the modern higher education system, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, leading humanist, uh, figure of the Enlightenment, who wrote extensively on education and human development and uh, argued, I think, uh, kind of very plausibly that the a core uh, principle and uh, requirement of a fulfilled uh, human being is uh, the ability to inquire and create uh, constructively, independently, uh, without external controls uh, to move to a modern counterpart, uh, a leading physicist uh, who taught right here uh, used to tell his classes that it's not important what we cover in the class, it's important what you discover. Uh, to be truly educated from this point of view means to be in a position to inquire and create on the basis of the resources available to you, which you've come to appreciate and comprehend, uh, to know where to look, to know how to form, formulate serious questions, to uh, question a pr um, standard doctrine if, it, if that's appropriate, to, to find your own way, to uh, shape the questions that are worth pursuing and to uh, develop the path to pursue them. That means knowing, understanding many things, uh, but also much more important than what you have stored in your mind, to know where to look, how to look, how to question, how to challenge, uh, how to proceed uh, independently to uh, deal with the challenges that uh, the world presents to you and that you develop in the course of your self-education and uh, 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 inquiry and uh, uh, investigations in cooperation and solidarity with others. That's what an educational system should cultivate from kindergarten to the high graduate school and in uh, 
the best cases sometimes does. And that leads to uh, people who are, by, at least by my standards, well-educated. Uh, I'm wondering how you see uh, the role of our educational system, what it's doing right now, what forces are driving it, and what constraints are on it, and how should it operate? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I quoted the uh, Trilateral Commission view of the educational system, uh, namely it's a system of indoctrination of the young. And I think that's correct. It's a system of indoctrination of the young. That was the way the liberal elites regard it, and they're more or less accurate. Uh, so the educational system is supposed to train people to be uh, obedient, conformist, uh, not think too much, uh, do what you're told, stay passive, don't cause any crises of democracy, don't raise any questions, and so on. That's basically what the, what the uh, system is about. Uh, even the fact that the system has a lot of stupidity in it, I think, has a function. You know, it means that people are filtered out for obedience. If you can guarantee lots of stupidity in the educational system, you know, like stupid assignments and things like that, you know that the only people who will make it through are people like me and like most of you, I guess, who are willing to do it no matter how stupid it is because we'll, we want to go to the next step, you know. So you may know that this assignment is idiotic and the guy up there couldn't think his way out of a paper bag, but you'll do it anyway uh, because that's the way you get to the next class uh, and, and you want to make it and so on and so forth. Well, there are people who don't do that. You know, uh, there are people who say, I'm not going to do it, it's too ridiculous, you know. Uh, those people are called behavioral problems or uh, something like that. They end up in the principal's office or in the streets or selling drugs or whatever. And all of this is a technique for uh, selection for obedience. And I, have, I don't know how to prove this, but I have a feeling that when you go to the elite universities, you find more obedience and conformity, probably because you're getting the students who were better able to do it. You know. uh, well, all of that is functional. That's the way it works. But it, and it works right through graduate school. I mean, if you, it, there are, by the time you get to graduate school, it's already a little more varied because some real contradictions develop in the system. The problem is that you can't have progress this way. You know, now, especially in the sciences and engineering, that's a problem because the corporations need science and engineering. You know, if you don't have innovation, you're really in trouble. So they have to encourage creativity and independence because you can't get anywhere if you just copy what somebody told you. You have to be challenging things all the time, challenging everything, you know, uh, and thinking new thoughts and so on. And there you got a real contradiction. Uh, it's hard to train people to be creative and challenging and so on, and yet to ensure that somewhere else in their lives they're conformist and obedient and never think. So you have problems. That's a serious problem in Japan, incidentally. Uh, we think of Japan as this tremendous superpower, but that's very misleading. Uh, Japan, for example, is very poor in science, for example, and they're aware of it. And part of the reason is it's, such, it's, part, of the, it's part of the same thing that makes them good workers, obedient workers. It's a very obedient society, very deferential and conformist society. And one effect of that is that you, you know, there are real constraints against independent, free thinking, and you see it in the sciences very clearly. Uh, the, uh, but it's a problem here too. So there are those contradictions. When you get to graduate school, they're beginning to show up. They show up much less in the ideological subjects, because there it doesn't matter so much if people have, you know, there isn't, it, it, profits aren't made by historians having original ideas about the French Revolution, so they can have conventional ideas. And that means that the, the pressure to try to support innovation and freedom is much less, and the, profession, the pressures for conformity, on the other hand, are much greater because in the ideological subjects it begins to be dangerous if people think the wrong thoughts. It's not so dangerous if they have new ideas about physics. Uh, so, so you get, but nevertheless, you, know, you, there's, you begin to get a little flux in the system by the time you get to graduate school. And this goes all the way through uh, uh, up to uh, you know, graduate school and research. It's just two different ways of looking at the world. When you, when you get to, a, say, a research institution like the one we're now in, at the graduate level, it, uh, it essentially follows the uh, Enlightenment tradition. In fact, science and uh, it couldn't progress unless it was uh, based on uh, inculcation of the uh, urge to challenge, uh, to uh, uh, question uh, doctrine, question authority, uh, search for alternatives, uh, uh, use your imagination, uh, act 
freely under your own impulses. Cooperative work with others is constant, as you can see just by walking down the halls. And even at lower levels, you find it. I mean, there's, you know, there are teachers who do stimulate thought, and sometimes they get away with it. And uh, all the way through, uh, you know, if, you, if people are learning things, you just, you just can't control, you can't make them just regurgitate what they heard. Now, there's a lot of pressure to turn the schools into the Marine Corps. Uh, and there's a lot of support for it. Uh, for example, there's this bestseller last couple of years by Alan Bloom. Uh, that was all over the supermarket, closing of the American mind. Yeah, which every you know huge bestseller supermarket racks, which is where I read it, and things like that. Uh, well, you take a look at what he's saying, uh, and, and there was plenty, you know, a lot of enthusiastic uh, accolades for it, and so on. Uh, he was saying that. A couple of us smart guys will decide what the great thoughts are, uh, and every student will memorize them, and that's education. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, that's a way to turn people into pure automata. I mean, even if they happen to pick the great thoughts, uh, there is no way less likely to get anybody to think about those thoughts than to make that the curriculum. That finishes them off. You know. Uh, uh, but uh, and I think that's the purpose, really. I mean, the purpose is just to impose authority, you know. Here's the great thoughts, all this other stuff is rubbish, just learn those and you're okay. I'll pick them, you memorize them. That's basically the line. Uh, now, of course, that's, that's the opposite of education. I mean, that's the way you study Talmud or something like that. Uh, but uh, it's very popular, and I think it reflects the same concern over the crisis of democracy. In fact, Alan was it Bloom himself was extremely, the incident that really got to him was a case in Cornell where he was a professor where some black students took over one of the, one of the buildings and he, was, he said that's just like the Nazis, you know, it's back to the Nazis, he has a whole business about the Nazis and so on and so forth. Well, you take a look at what happened in that, he doesn't tell you what he thought, the, and he says the faculty capitulated, you know, just like Heidegger capitulated to the Nazis and so on. Uh, what actually happened, if you look back, is that there were real grievances, undoubtedly the students shouldn't have done what they did and go into the building with guns and so on, but it was settled very amicably. It was settled amicably, amicably. nobody was killed, uh, the grievances were to some extent dealt with, and the net result was better than it was before. Well, he didn't tell you what he thought they should have done, but it's sort of implicit. I mean, uh, I guess they should have bombed the place or something like that. Uh, but uh, that's what really set him off. And in general, what set many people off was, the, the, you know, the, the 60s are now described in the literature as if it was a time when students were running around burning libraries and you know, destroying the foundations of civilization and so on. What was actually going on is they were asking questions. You know, they were raising questions, they were uh, looking into things that people hadn't looked into before, they were not just obedient. And from the point of view of a lot of the faculty, that's equivalent to burning the buildings. You know, you can't, that small distinction, you can't make that. Uh, and uh, there's pressure to turn the schools back to the days when you didn't have to worry about those things, like disobedient students asking questions about things that you didn't tell them to think about and so on. Uh, here you speak a little bit about, I know it's a big topic, but uh, the U.S. education system, particularly in light of what we're seeing around the country and budget cuts and people willing to let teachers go without a lot of second thought. Well, that's a really important issue. The, uh, the public education system was one of the uh, real uh, major achievements of this country. It was the first country to have a really uh, broad mass education system uh, that contributed enormously not only to the cultural health of the country but to its economic growth. Uh, that after the Second World War uh, there was a the major period of economic growth in U.S. history was the several decades after the Second World War. And a substantial reason for that was uh, the GI Bill, which allowed a huge number of people, not enough unfortunately, but a huge number of people to go to college who would never been able to do it. And in those days, college was cheap. Public education was free. I mean, I went to college in 1945 and I happened to go to the local, I went to the local school, you know, you never went anywhere else, but the local school happened to be the University of Pennsylvania, which, which is private, but it was a hundred dollars, you know, 
and uh, you could get a, and you could easily get a scholarship. So education was basically free, and for the GI Bill, it's a huge number of people, and that had an enormous impact. Well, all of that's being reversed. There's an attack on public education, which is without any precedent, because all the way from kindergarten up to the universities. So take, say, the universities. Uh, well, I'll just tell you a personal experience. A couple of months ago, I travel around a lot giving talks. I happened to give a talk at, uh, in Mexico City uh, at the National University. A pretty impressive university, a couple hundred thousand students, very high level, uh, very engaged. I mean, fat salaries are ridiculously low by our standards, but they work. The facilities are pretty good. It's free. That's a poor country, you know? But public education is free. And furthermore, in Mexico City itself, there's a city-run college, which is not only free, but has open admissions. So anybody can go, and if they need help to get in, they get remedial training. I was there too, you know, pretty impressive, also high standards. Well, that's a poor country. Uh, I happened to go from there to uh, the Bay Area in California. It's maybe the richest place in the world outside of uh, the Gulf Emirates. Uh, they, uh, the public education system is being systematically destroyed. Uh, tuition is so high in the major universities that it's just for the rich. It's in fact, it's at the level of Ivy League colleges. Uh, more, for this year, for the first time, uh, more funding for the public institutions is coming from tuition than from the state in a rich state, not Mexico. Uh, and this is happening all over the country. I mean, a majority of the states by now, the tuition in the public universities is uh, higher than funding. Now, it's not because of the lack of wealth, and it's not because of the deficit, which is complete farce, as is easily to show. It's because of the decision to destroy public education. The, in California, for example, the, uh, the great universities, which are being, will be pri almost certainly be privatized. They're almost private now, you know, very high tuitions, uh, big endowments, and so on. And that means the rest of the system it gets kind of lowered to uh, low-level technical training. Well, you know, for the economy of, I mean, forget the human cost, for the economy of California, that's very serious. California became rich in large measure because of the uh, high level education system. Well, the people who are running the program, that top one tenth of one percent of the population, they don't care. I mean, their kids will be fine. You know, they don't use the public education system. If it's privatized, they can pay for it. They have phenomenal wealth. And there's a chain, and this generalizes over the country, we have to recognize a significant change in the nature of contemporary state capitalism from the 70s. Uh, you go back to the 1950s, uh, the CEO of a firm, say General Motors, had to care about the future of the firm. Uh, they had to have brand loyalty, you know, uh, the firm had to persist and so on. So they tried to build it so it would persist. That's not true anymore. Uh, the CEO of, say, General Electric, which is mostly a financial institution, all they have to do is make money in the short term. I mean, and then, of course, they get bailed out by the taxpayer if anything goes wrong. But if the company itself declines, it doesn't matter. They walk away with their golden parachute. That's the new system. And as for the country, they don't really care about it. Along with the financialization of uh, the economy came offshoring of production. So if you can make more profit by uh, uh, using uh, super cheap exploited labor in uh, uh, China, let's say, without environmental constraints and so on, fine. It happens to harm this country severely, but that's not their concern. So we're getting into a situation where the future of the country just doesn't matter for the people, for the decision makers. And it's going all the way down to uh, elementary school. I don't have to tell you, there's a huge attack on teachers I mean, in an effort to try to shift the blame for, for, for the financial crisis and a general economic crisis away from, you know, 
Goldman Sachs to uh, the public school teachers and the firefighters with their huge pensions. And it's so ludicrous, you can hardly believe that they're getting away with it. And there is a backlash, like in Wisconsin, a significant backlash, but it's certainly going on. And it, it is, uh, so, so you're right, there's a major effort to destroy the public school system. Now, I think there's a fundamental reason behind that. It's not just that the rich don't care. The, I think the same thing lies behind the attack on Social Security. Uh, Social Security is a phenomenally successful program has almost no administrative costs. I mean, far less than privatized insurance and so on. Very cheap, works very well, keeps a lot of people alive. Uh, it doesn't mean much to, to people in higher income levels. You know, they get a small amount, they can forget it. But for a lot of the population, that's what keeps them surviving, particularly after the, uh, the huge uh, economic collapse, the collapse of the real estate bubble. So, so why attack Social Security? Well, partly it's of no benefit to the rich, but there's a deeper reason, I think, and I think it's the same reason as the public education system. I can't prove it, but this is what it looks like to me. The public education system and Social Security are based on a certain principle, namely the principle that we care about other people. Okay. And that's, so, yeah. Social Security means you care that a disabled widow across town doesn't have food to eat. Or let's say I don't have kids in school, but you know I'm happy to pay school taxes because I care that the kid across the street can go to school. And, uh, and this, this concept of sympathy and social solidarity is considered extremely dangerous. There's a major effort, propaganda effort, to try to drive into people's heads that you should only be concerned for yourself. Now, there's nothing new about this. You go back in America, it's good to learn you know, about American history. You go back to, say, 1850, the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution, and incidentally, the period of the freest press in the United States. There were hundreds, thousands of newspapers, with a lot of readership, the direct participation. They were written, factory workers and others. And one of the main themes was uh, uh, anger at what was called the new spirit of the age. Uh, gain wealth, forgetting all but self. That was the new spirit of the age in 1850. And there's been a tremendous effort over the years to somehow drive that into people's heads and drive out all normal human feelings. And, you know, it's, uh, it's had some success. And I think you see it in the uh, willingness of parts of the population, at least, to try to kill the elements of the society and the culture that are based on care and concern for other people. And to try to turn people into crazed maniacs who care about nothing but themselves. Well, that's all that's pretty dangerous. Again, if it was happening in some small country, you know, it'd be a shame. But when it's happening in the richest, most powerful country in history, it's very dangerous. Education is discussed in terms of whether it's a worthwhile investment, that does it create human capital that can be used for economic growth and so on. That's a very strange, it's a, it kind of a, a very a distorting way to even pose the question, I think. Do we want to have a society of free, creative, independent individuals uh, able to appreciate and uh, gain from the cultural achievements of the past and to add to them? Do we want that? Or do we want people who can uh, increase GDP? They're not necessarily the same, they're not the same thing. And uh, uh, a, a, an education of the kind that uh, uh, say, Bertrand Russell, John Dewey, and others talked about, that's a value in itself. Uh, whatever, uh, whatever impact it has in society, it's a value because it helps create better human beings. And after all, that's what an educational system should be for. On the other hand, if you want to look at it in terms of uh, costs and benefits, uh, take the new technology that we were just talking about, where'd that come from? 
well, actually a lot of it was developed right where we're sitting. Uh, down below where we now are was a major laboratory back in the 1950s, where I was employed, in fact, which was uh, had uh, lots of uh, scientists, engineers, uh, uh, people of all kinds of interests, philosophers, others, who were working on developing the basic character of the, and even the basic tools of the uh, uh, t technology that is now common. Uh, computers and the internet, for example, uh, were pretty much in the public sector for decades, just funded in places like this, uh, where people were exploring new possibilities that were mostly unthought of, at the, unheard of at the time. Uh, some of them worked, some didn't. The ones that worked were finally converted into tools that people can use. Uh, that's the way uh, scientific progress takes place. It's the way uh, the cultural progress takes place uh, generally. Uh, uh, classical uh, uh, artists, for example, came out of a tradition of craftsmanship that was developed over long periods with uh, master artisans, with others, and sometimes, sometimes uh, you can rise on their shoulders and uh, create new uh, uh, marvelous things. Uh, but it doesn't come from nowhere if there isn't uh, a, a lively uh, 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 cultural and educational system which is geared towards encouraging uh, creative exploration, uh, independence of thought, uh, willingness to uh, challenge, to cross frontiers, to challenge uh, accepted beliefs and so on. If you don't have that, you're not going to get the technology that can lead to uh, uh, economic gains, though that I don't think is the prime purpose of uh, 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 cultural enrichment and education as a part of it. While it's true that our genetic program rigidly constrains us, I think the more important point is that the existence of that rich of that rigid constraint is what provides the basis for our freedom and creativity. And uh, the reason... What do you mean? It's only because we're pre-programmed that we can do all the things well, we can do. Exactly. The point is yeah. that if, if we really were plastic organisms without an extensive pre-programming, then the state that our mind achieves would in fact be a reflection of the environment, which means it would be extraordinarily impoverished. Uh, fortunately for us, we're rigidly pre-programmed with extremely rich systems that are part of our biological endowment. Take, say, the growth of an organism, say a, an amoeba or a human being. A human being has a lot of complex uh, capacities and characteristics, even a complex internal structure, like the way your digestive system works and so on. And it can do a lot of things. But that's because we're designed within a framework that allows certain options and blocks others. Right. Suppose that the genetic endowment said become anything. Right. Okay, so arbitrarily you'd end up some uh, lump of something or other with no capacities and no ability to do anything. Right. It's the same with the arts. So this was understood in classical aesthetics. So if you read the aesthetic theories of the eight, 17th, 18th century, they understood that creativity presupposes a set of rules, forms and rules. Uh, if you, uh, you, can, you can challenge the rules. And like, it can be one form of creativity is challenging the rules. If you have no structure and no rules at all, it's, you know, it's like uh, tossing paint at the wall. Right. It's not, not a creative act. Right. This is the value of dissonance. Well, cre there's got to be some structure that provides you with capacities. Right. If you don't have internal structure, this is for growth and development, but even the same for, um, uh, uh, say, creative activity right. is... Uh, so what kind of structures support creativity and what kind of structures inhibit creativity? Structures that support it are, uh, uh, take, say, writing a sonnet. There are rules for a sonnet. Okay, that framework of rules enables people to do really creative work. You know, you read right. classical sonnets. It's, if you had no rules at all, you just, uh, then I could write poetry. I can't. Uh, and the, the structure that's there has to be, uh, or take, say, a, a, a painting. Uh, here, too, it's been studied in the history of art by Meyer Shapiro and others. 
a painting is in a frame. Well, that alone imposes structure. Right. It's on a flat surface, okay? That requires you to invent perspective. Uh, and uh, a long time before people understood it and uh, how to make uh, it look like a gown is flowing. And all. Okay, that, that frame itself, just that simple, even that simple frame already impose, sets the conditions mm -hmm. under which you can carry out creative act. Behind any significant use of contemporary technology, the, internet, uh, communication systems, uh, with graphics, whatever it may be, uh, behind, unless behind it is some uh, well-constructed uh, directive conceptual apparatus, it is very unlikely to be helpful. It may turn out to be harmful. Uh, for example, uh, a random exploration through the internet uh, turns out to be a, 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 a cult generator you pick up a factoid here and a factoid there and somebody else reinforces it and uh, all of a sudden you have some uh, uh, you know, crazed uh, picture which has some factual basis but nothing to do with the world. Uh, you have to know how to evaluate, interpret and understand. I mean, the, the, say biology again, the, the person who wins the Nobel Prize in biology is not the person who read the most journal articles and uh, took most notes on them. It's the person who knew what to look for and cultivating that capacity to seek what's significant, always willing to question whether you're on the right track. Now that's what uh, education is gonna be about, whether it's using uh, computers and the internet or pencil and paper and books. And what do you recommend for people who want to study at university, university level, but cannot afford it and do not wanna get tangled up in loans and debt? Well, what they ought to do, I mean, this, you know, you can't, answer the question for an individual, but we should be answering it collectively. So we should be asking, for example, why is there, uh, why are there costs for higher education? And why isn't it like secondary education? And again, that's not a strange question. There's certainly no economic basis for it. If you look around the world today, uh, uh, the richest, most successful countries have free, virtually free higher education. So Germany, which is the most successful of the modern state capitalist societies, uh, higher education is virtually free. Uh, Finland, which comes out at the top in almost all international competitions, free, and so on across the board. If you go to poor countries, just go south of the border to Mexico, poor country, quite a respectable higher education system. Uh, been there and taught. It's, it's very, quite respectable, high quality. It has problems like very low salaries, so the faculty have to have second jobs, but that's because it's a very poor country. Education's free. Uh, take a look at our own country. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, 50s and 60s, the great growth period, highest growth period in American society, uh, higher education was virtually free for a huge number of people. It was not only free, but subsidized, namely those beneficiaries of the GI Bill. People who never would have gone to college were enabled to do so, very good for themselves, very good for the country, contributed to successful economic growth. Uh, even private colleges, like Ivy League colleges, though they had tuition, it was extremely low. Uh, I, I entered the University of Pennsylvania in uh, Ivy League College in 1945. Uh, tuition was $100. That would be maybe $800 by today's real value. And you could easily get a scholarship. So it was essentially free. Uh, it was a much poorer country then. The U.S. today is far richer than it was in that period. I think if you think it through, there can't really be an economic reason for this. There are other reasons, not good reasons. You can think what they might be. But I think uh, in answer to the question, an individual is stuck. You gotta, that person is stuck with what exists. But as part of a collective, uh, that person is not stuck. Uh, they can be part of an effort to reverse the programs of the past, the, the um, policies of the past 30 years, roughly 30, 40 years, 
which have led to the situation in which young people are trapped for life with debt that they cannot get rid of. Notice that the pol I'm sure you know this, the policies are set up so that you can't declare bankruptcy like a business. Uh, the government can garnish your social security. You're trapped for life, a highly disciplinary measure, incidentally. And I don't think there's any justification for it. Like other things, individually, you can't do much about it. Collectively, you could do quite a lot. Even in the fields in which I've worked all my life, say professionally, uh, the more you learn, the less you, the more you realize, the less you know. I mean, as you, what happens is, is standard in the sciences, but everywhere else too. You know, you uh, you, look, you 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 learn more. Uh, you think you're approaching some kind of a horizon, but in fact, the horizon is receding. Yeah. Yeah. And the more you learn, the f more you see that horizon is very far away. Um, it's true, and I could give you examples from my own field, but it's true in the core sciences. I mean, take, say, physics, you know, the star of the sciences. Now, they've got some problems. Like, one problem is they can't find 90% of the mass energy in the universe. Uh, it's, it's postulated because otherwise nothing works, uh, but you uh, can't find it. You can't find any evidence that is there. Uh, pretty serious problem. Uh, I remember about 10 years ago, this one was finally overcome, about 10 years ago, the uh, this big the Hubble telescope, you know, which is out in space, it was bringing in tons of information about outer space. And there was a time when it turned out that the that had very powerful evidence that uh, the universe was considerably younger than its oldest stars. Well, that's a pretty serious problem. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, and any, in any field you are, that's what you find all the time. When you turn to human affairs, you know, our understanding is extremely thin. Almost everything is, you're learning all the time from uh, from other people, from you know your children, your friends, your enemies, uh, so depths of human possibilities and capacities that we can barely perceive. Uh, uh, when you look at different fields, I mean, you know, sometimes when I'm having a boring interview on the uh, telephone and I'm trying to think about something else because the questions are too boring, and I start looking around the room. Where, where I work, you know, full of books piled up to the sky and so on, and I, all different kinds of topics, and then start calculating uh, how many centuries would I have to live uh, reading 24 hours a day, every day of the week, <laughs> to make a dent in what I'd like to learn about things. You know, we have little bits of understanding, glimpses, a little bit of light here and there, but uh, a tremendous amount of darkness. Uh, which is a challenge. You know, it'd be, life would be pretty boring if we understood everything. It's better if we don't understand anything. <laughs> and know that we don't. That's the important part. Well, we can ask ourselves what the purpose of an educational system is. And, of course, there are uh, sharp differences on, on this matter. Uh, there's the uh, traditional in, an interpretation that comes from the Enlightenment, which uh, holds that uh, the highest goal in life is uh, to inquire and create, uh, to uh, uh, search the uh, riches of the past, uh, try to uh, uh, internalize the parts of them that are significant to you, uh, carry that uh, quest for understanding further in your own way. The purpose of education uh, from that point of view is just to help people determine how to learn on their own. It's you, the learner, who is going to achieve. Uh, in the course of education, and it's really up to you what you'll master, where you'll go, how you'll use it, uh, uh, how you'll go on to produce something new and exciting for yourself, maybe for others. That's one concept of education. Now, the other concept is essentially indoctrination. People have to show the idea that from childhood, uh, uh, young people have to be uh, placed into a framework in which they'll follow orders, accept uh, existing frameworks uh, not challenge and so on and this is often quite explicit uh, so for example uh, after the uh, activism of the 1960s 
Uh, there was great concern across much of the uh, educated spectrum that uh, uh, young people were just getting too free and independent, uh, that the country was becoming too democratic and so on. And in fact, there's an important study on uh, what's called the crisis of democracy, too much democracy, uh, uh, arguing that uh, 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 there are uh, claiming that there are certain institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. That's their phrase, and they're not doing their job properly. That's uh, schools, universities, churches. We have to change them so that they carry out the job of indoctrination and control more effectively. That's actually coming from the liberal internationalist uh, uh, end of the spectrum of the internet of the. Uh, a spectrum of educated opinion. And in fact, since that time, there have been many measures taken to try to uh, turn uh, the educational system towards uh, more control, more indoctrination, uh, uh, more vocational training, uh, 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 imposing a debt which traps students, young people, into a life of conformity and so on. That's uh, the exact opposite of the uh, what I refer to as the tradition that comes out of the Enlightenment. And there's a constant struggle between those uh, in the colleges, in the schools. And in the schools, do you train for passing tests or do you train for creative uh, inquiry, uh, pursuing uh, interests that are aroused by material that's presented and that you want to pursue either on your own or in cooperation with others? Uh, there is in the recent period particularly uh, an increasing uh, shaping of uh, education from the early ages towards on, uh, towards uh, passing examinations. Uh, that can be, t uh, taking tests can be of some use, uh, both for the person who's taken the test, see what I know and where, where I am, what I've achieved, what I haven't, uh, for instructors, uh, uh, what should be changed and improved in, uh, in developing the uh, course of instruction. But uh, beyond that, they don't really tell you very much. I mean, I know for for many, many years I was on, I've been on admissions committees for uh, uh, entry into an advanced graduate program, maybe one of the most advanced anywhere. And we, of course, pay some attention to test results, but really not too much. I mean, uh, you can, uh, a person can uh, do magnificently on every test and understand very little. I mean, all of us who've been through uh, schools and colleges and universities are very familiar with this. Uh, you can be assigned, uh, 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 you can be in some, say, course uh, that you have no interest in, and uh, there's demand that you pass a, a test, and you can study hard for the test, and you can uh, ace it, to use the idiom, and do fine. And uh, three week, uh, a couple of weeks later, you forgot what the, what the topic was. I'm sure we've all had that experience. I know I have. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it can be a useful device if it contributes to uh, the constructive purposes of education. Uh, if it's just a set of hurdles you have to cross, it can turn out to be not only meaningless, but it can divert you away from things you want to be doing. Actually, I see this regularly when I talk to teachers. I'll just give you one experience from a couple of weeks ago, but there's plenty like it. I have to be talking to a group which included many school teachers. One of them was a sixth grade teacher, teaches kids at guess, 10 or 11 or 11 or 12, something like that. Uh, she came up to me afterwards and I'd been talking about these things and she told me that of an experience that she had just had uh, in her class, uh, after one of the classes, uh, a little girl came up to her and said she was really interested in something that came up and she asked how she could, uh, could the teacher give her some ideas about how to look into it further. And the teacher was compelled to tell her I'm sorry, but you can't do that. You have to study to pass this uh, national exam that's coming. That's going to determine your future. The teacher didn't say it, but it's going to determine my future, like uh, whether I am rehired and so on. Uh, the system is geared to getting the children to pass hurdles, but not to learn and understand and explore. Now, that child would have been better off if she had been allowed to explore what she was interested in and maybe not do so well in the test about things she wasn't interested in. And they'll come along when they fit into her interests and concerns. And uh, so a test, I don't say that tests should be eliminated, they can be a useful educational tool, but ancillary, you know, something that's just helping improve for ourselves, for instructors and others what we're doing.
and tell us where we ought to be uh, moving. But they don't even, passing tests doesn't begin to compare with uh, searching and inquiring and uh, uh, into uh, uh, pursuing topics that engage us and uh, excite us. That's uh, far more significant than passing tests. If that's the kind of educational career that you're given the opportunity to pursue, you'll remember what you discovered. Uh, which is a famous physicist, a world famous physicist right here at MIT, who, uh, like a lot of the senior faculty, was teaching freshman courses. Uh, he once said that in his freshman course, students will ask, uh, what are we going to cover this semester? And his standard answer was, it doesn't matter what we cover. It matters what you discover. And that's right. Uh, teaching ought to be uh, in, uh, inspiring students to discover on their own. Uh, uh, to, to, to challenge if they don't agree, to look for alternatives if they think they're better ones, uh, to uh, work through the uh, great achievements of the past and try to master them on their own because they're interested in them. If that's the way uh, uh, teaching and, uh, is done, students will uh, really gain from it and will uh, uh, not only remember what they studied, but will be able to use it as a basis for going on on their own. And again, education is really aimed at just uh, uh, helping students get to the point where they can learn on their own, because that's what you're going to do for, their, for, for your life, not just uh, absorb materials given to you from the outside and repeat it. What gives you hope? People like you. That's the hope of the future. The future's in your hands. There's a lot that can be done. Uh, despite all the problems of the country, it's actually a much more civilized country than it was 50 years ago, much more in all kinds of ways. Uh, the role, of, uh, the rights, rights of women, for example, all sorts of other things. Uh, that didn't come as a gift, came out of popular struggle, often pretty hard, but it left a legacy to us. We benefit from it. It kind of gives us a plateau from which to go on. Plenty of problems. In fact, the worst problems in human history, but they can be addressed. And people like you are in a position to address them. And that's where the hope is. Uh, that's my view what uh, an educational system should be like down to kindergarten. Uh, but uh, there uh, certainly are uh, powerful structures in the society which would prefer people to be indoctrinated, conform, not ask too many questions be obedient, uh, fulfill the uh, roles that are assigned to you, and don't try to shake systems of power and authority. Uh, those are choices we have to make either as uh, people, that, wherever we stand in the educational system, as students, as teachers, as people on the outside trying to help shape it in the directions in which we think it ought to go.